Okay, we are recording. You may go to the washroom, go ahead. Okay, so we're going to talk today about the Big Five personality model. This doesn't relate to social studies, but this is something I found a lot of value from. Actually, for the, I've actually gotten Ms. Rantucci and Mr. Murphy to take this test as well, and we've had a discussion about what their results were. I've taken two tests in the past myself, and it's taught a lot not only, not only about myself, but the people around me. Even uh, when I teach, I have an idea of the different aspects of personality I see in my students. Okay, So we're going to go into that. Before we do... So there are five major categories. That's why it's called the big five. Otherwise, they call it the big six or four or three. There are five major categories that we are assessing personality upon, and they break down into two minor components. So a quick acronym for the five major personality components is OCEAN. Okay, we'll look into that. Okay, the first one is openness to experience. So. This is the primary dimension of creativity, artistic interest, and intelligence, and particularly verbal intelligence, your ability to speak. Okay. I was just talking to Mr. Murphy about this in the morning, and I think my suspicion is that openness to experience does correlate highly with actual IQ intelligence, right? So particularly we were discussing like, you know, there are people who are very artistic and they have this degree of artistic skill. And those people are could be considered a genius in their artistic skill. Now, the thing about intelligence is that there are many ways to be intelligent. You know, you could be very mathematically smart, scientifically, you could be very good at writing, expressing ideas. You could be able to draw a painting, paint something, whatever, right? So there's a lot of ways to be smart, but there's very few ways to be dumb, <laughs> okay? Openness to experience is a measure of interest in novelty or new things, art, literature, abstract thinking, philosophy, learning, as well as sensitivity to aesthetic emotions and beauty. So for myself, I rank very high in openness to experience and it's two subcategories. And part of that shows when you walk into my room, you see I have this artwork given to me by students, some artwork I've collected, things that I've liked, posters. Okay, I'm a very aesthetic person. It plays a role in my life. Okay, let's break this down. Uh, oh, also, this is my Marvel PowerPoint. So hopefully, all of you know the you know Avengers characters. So Brooklyn doesn't, but that's okay. She's probably not really listening right now. So we have intellect and openness underneath openness to experience. So intellect again is not to be confused with IQ specifically. Intellect is your interest in abstract ideas or philosophical thinking. So you know if you like to go home and learn more about any subject, a particular game, whether it's like I know when I was playing Call of Duty, I would go on YouTube and I'd figure out the best gun builds, right? I just have this interest in, okay, what is the best way to do with a certain thing? I have that same philosophy for when I'm teaching, what is the best way to teach writing a particular essay style or written response style, okay? Additionally, like even the, the one of the books I have on my desk right now is called the Birth Order Book. So this has nothing, at least as far as I'm aware, has nothing to do with my job or my personal life, but it is information I want to learn about. And, and I'm just at the start of the book, so I can't really uh, tell you more about the book. In terms of Doctor Strange, you know, again, so when Doctor Strange shows up to the, uh, I forget what they, the Kamartage, whatever they call his, his uh, sanctuary, the first thing he does is he asks, where are the forbidden books? I want, I want the top line knowledge. I want the best of the best. Okay, and then he gets told no. Right, there's a, there's a sequence, there's a level. He's gotta earn his way to that rank. And so what does he do? He spends all his time just devouring books. He's learning as much as he can about the ancient magic and spells and, and about the ancient knowledge, right? It, he very quickly goes from being a beginner to potentially, I think, um, probably into the next movie he will be, um, do you need to go to the bathroom? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, probably in the next movie he will be the head sorcerer, right, whatever they call it. But Dr. Strange is a great example of intellect. He's constantly learning. And then even in his private life, he was a surgeon, right? He was at the top of the line. He was one of the best people in his industry. And he's always curious and learning about new things. On the openness side is, you know, if you recall the fight that Dr. Strange has with Thanos, there are certain parts of the fight where it looks like, hey, this guy might actually be as strong as Thanos. He might actually be able to win on his own. But when you see him use his particular spells, his magic, he's able to construct together a variety of creative ways to both defend and attack, okay? And so that's part of openness, that creativity. It's not just about whether you're able to paint, draw, write, play an instrument, it's also how do you creatively construct ideas together, 
for certain sequences, right? There, every now and then there are athletes who come into a sport and they, um, what is the word? They, they revitalize the sport, they rejuvenate it by adding in their own creative way to make certain uh, maneuvers, positions, certain def defense systems, offense systems, and they recreate the sport. Again, that relates to that creativity aspect. Both the intellect and the creativity come together to help change the way this sport looks. Okay, so let's move on. Next is conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is the primary dimension of beautiful achievement in the big five uh, personality trait. It's a measure of obligation, attention to detail, hard work, persistence, cleanliness, efficiency, and adherence to rules, standards, and processes. So the thing about the school system is uh, it's set up and designed in a way so that the people with the most who rank highest in conscientiousness do the best, right? That's the thing. We just inundate you with so many assignments, so much work, that if you're not willing to see things through to the end, whatever you're tasked with, right? Because that's your obligation. So if I give you an assignment, some people high in conscientiousness will get the assignment done right away. Some people, they need the whole time. Some people take an extra couple of days. Some people, you know, they might hand it in one week, two weeks, a month late. I had a student last year handed in, you know, assignments during exam week, right? It's just low conscientiousness, which also relates to, because it's not just conscientiousness, it's also related to how interested you are in what you're learning, okay? So again, to clarify, conscientiousness is essentially how you follow through on the tasks you are given. So whether it be, you know, your parents give you some chores or your coach tells you to run a certain drill or your teacher gives you an assignment or you set yourself, I don't know, a new year's resolution. How likely are you to follow through and make sure you finish what you're supposed to finish? That's conscientiousness. Okay, this breaks down into industriousness and orderliness. So two great examples here. So uh, Iron Man, he's very industrious. Okay, industriousness is just you know, maybe you know someone, a friend, a parent, and maybe it's yourself, someone who's always working, always getting things done. So in the Marvel movies, you have Iron Man. In each of his movies, he encounters a major problem with his technology. And at the next movie, he always fixes and repairs that. He's always industriously working to solve that problem. So uh, one of the students in grade nine who, who I gave this presentation to yesterday mentioned that, um, so there's a point, so Rhodey, uh, war machine, he gets shot down out of the sky and his Iron Man suit falls to the ground and he breaks his spine. In the next movie, what does Iron Man do for uh, Peter Parker's suit? He puts a parachute in there just in case, right? In case his technology fails, he has a backup plan, okay? Additionally, so in Iron Man 3, Iron Man is fighting these guys in his home and, and his suit falls into the water and he gets knocked unconscious and the suit puts in the last trajectory, the last map setting he had, and shoots him into the middle of frozen America, right? He, he lands in some wintry spot. You know, he was just soaking wet. He has no winter clothes, and he has this risk of potentially freezing. So again, he solves that problem. He's very industrious. He solves the problem. His next set of suits have heaters inside them, right? So industrious people are always working nonstop. And the problem with that is if you're very industrious, you'll essentially work yourself to death, right? Which is not good because then, then your work drops to zero. But people who are very low in industriousness, it doesn't matter if it's a due date, a deadline, potentially getting fired because you're gonna be late for the fifth time, right? Those people struggle to get their work done. Maybe that's you, right? But, but then again, like keep in mind your own personal interests. So maybe you're a lot more industrious when it comes to your personal interests. Right? So whatever you're doing at home, your hobbies, maybe you'll work really hard for those, but not so much the things you're not interested in. Okay. Orderliness, I look at, uh, personally, I look at this as rule following, as, as responding to your obligations. So that's why I chose young Captain America. You know, he's a bit naive. He trusts in the government and he trusts in the rules and he follows all these rules and regulations. You're supposed to do things the right way. And then, you know, in that, in the first Avengers movie, young Captain America is actually he actually doesn't like Iron Man at all because he thinks, well, Iron Man is very selfish and very uh, self-motivated and, you know, he doesn't do anything for the team. Captain America is high in orderliness, so he believes in the moral authority and in, in what is morally correct and that's how he acts, right? And that's orderliness, okay? 
Orderliness is also how clean you keep your room, your locker, your desk, your personal life. People who are low in orderliness, you know, their room is probably messy. They probably don't have a schedule. They're probably not time oriented, right? And so if that resonates with you, maybe you're a little low on orderliness, right? Or maybe you're somewhere in the middle. You do it for some things and you, do, you don't do it for others. Okay, extroversion. Um, extroversion is a primary dimension of positive emotion. So, uh, and we'll break this down, but it's a, sensi it's a general sensitivity to positive emotions such as hope, joy, anticipation, and approach, particularly in social situations. So people who rank high in extroversion, I, for the record, I rank 98th percentile. So in a room of 100 people, I'm going to be more extroverted than 97 of them and less extroverted than two of them. I'm very extroverted. And so I always look forward to social situations. Uh, I experience a lot of joy, a lot of hope. And so it makes me wonder when I see students who are prone to anxiety and negative emotions, that it makes me wonder about their personality. Where do they rank on extroversion and where do they rank on neuroticism? That's the last one we'll talk about when we, when we get to the end. Um, wonderful. Give me, give me a second. Hello. So again, extroversion, sorry for the pause, extroversion can relate to enthusiasm, talkativeness, assertiveness in social situations, but it's generally a desire and willingness and frequency of socializing, right? So some of you are probably like, hey, I wanna hang out with my friends every day, every minute of the day. Some of you are probably like, hey, I don't wanna hang out with people at all, anytime, any place. Most of you are probably somewhere in the middle, okay? But that relates to your extroversion. So extroversion itself breaks down into two specific categories. We have enthusiasm and we have assertiveness. So a really good example of enthusiasm is Ant-Man. He's simply just happy to be present, invited, and participating with particularly anything Captain America does because he's obsessed with him. But Ant-Man is a very enthusiastic guy. After spending five years in the, uh, in the uh, whatever dimension, right? He comes out, he finds out that half the world's gone, this big bad villain has killed everyone and the Avengers are dismantled pretty much. And he's still enthusiastic, he's still happy, he's still excited to see people, to hang out with people. And then he's also hopeful of the future, right? Ant-Man truly believes that they can figure out time travel, go back in time and solve this problem and bring everyone back, right? He's one of the higher enthusiast, enthusiasm uh, individuals in the Marvel. Uh, on the opposite, like hopefully all of you know who Eeyore is from, uh, from Winnie the Pooh. Eeyore is not a very enthusiastic person. I mean, he'll go with his friends, he'll do what they're doing, but he doesn't do it with enthusiasm. He doesn't do it willingly, right? He's kind of dragged along. And he doesn't experience a whole lot of positive emotion. Okay. Assertiveness, on the other hand, can, can manifest itself in multiple ways. So in social situations, assertiveness would be, you know, do you have a tendency to talk over other people? Or do you have a, do you have a tendency to make things go the way you want them to, right? That's asserting yourself onto your environment, right? So sometimes people tend to be middle or lower on assertiveness and they're not willing to advocate or express their own needs in a social situation. Maybe it's to a group of people, to a specific person, whether it's in a relationship or whether it's, you know, with your, like a romantic relationship or a platonic relationship, that assertiveness bit plays a role in how, how willing you are to express what you need. Are you going to assert what you need and want onto your environment? Okay. So Thanos is a great example of that. I mean, he doesn't care who gets in his way. He has his goal. He's going to snap his fingers and wipe out half of all living beings. And he's going to solve the problem that he has determined in his head. And he doesn't care who comes here to stop him or prevent him. Right. That, that's what assertiveness is. Okay. So we will move on from that. Okay. Agreeableness, this one's interesting. So a lot of people struggle in the workplace, in personal relationships due to their levels of agreeableness. So agreeableness is the primary dimension of interpersonal interaction. So that's your interactions with other people. So people who are high in agreeableness, 
they're compliant, they're nurturing, they're kind, potentially naively trusting, and they're conciliatory. Okay, so th these people are generally considered socially nice. They'll listen to you, they'll hear your problems, they'll do what you tell them to do. Like someone who's high in agreeableness, if they're told to do something, they'll probably do it. They don't know how to disagree. They, they're not comfortable with social conflict, right? Butting heads with people when you have a disagreement or a difference, okay? People who are low in agreeableness are not so nice, generally speaking, okay? For, for, the, for the record, I'm very low in agreeableness. Okay. Uh, they're a bit stubborn, they can be dominant, they could be harsh, skeptical, competitive, and in the extreme, depending on certain other characteristics, they can even be predatory. Let's say if they're low, uh, conscientious, or various other traits as well. Uh, I'm not 100% sure which one specifically off the top of my head. But that's agreeableness, right? Uh, and I will add, so typically women are more agreeable than men. Okay, and so many of the problems in interpersonal relationships can come from high agreeableness. You know, if you're not willing to stand up for yourself, to assert your needs in a social situation, it's unlikely that you'll have your needs met, right? If your need, so particularly in the workplace, you know, I'm sure you've heard this on the internet, that women get paid 77% of what men get paid, or 77 cents to every dollar a man makes, right? Now, there's many reasons for that, but from a personality standpoint, one of them is that, well, if you're in a competitive environment where you have to disagree with your boss on how much you should be getting paid, if you are high in agreeableness, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, for you to tell your boss, hey, you're paying me $70,000 a year, I think I'm worth $90,000 a year. That's a disagreement, that's a social conflict. If you're high in agreeableness, it's difficult for you to have that conflict. So that's one of the reasons potentially why that difference in pay exists because how willing are you to disagree with your boss on how much you should be making per year? Additionally, one of the biological reasons for why women could be higher in agreeableness is because, well, quite frankly, no matter what you hear on the internet, the reality is as a man, you're not gonna get, get pregnant and give birth. And you're not gonna have a baby. And the thing is, when you're dealing with a baby with an infant, you have to be agreeable. When the baby cries, you have to attend to the baby. And so as the mother, the primary caregiver, generally speaking, at least historically, what will happen is that if you're taking care of the baby and it starts crying, well, you have to respond to that. You can't be disagreeable and say, no, like, uh, you know, I'm busy working on the car. No, no, you have to go and take care of the baby. Otherwise, the baby will die. And that's a tragedy. It's a terrible thing. Right, so that's one of the biological historical reasons that women would be more agreeable than men in general, okay? Agreeableness breaks down into two minor categories. We have compassion, we have politeness, or in, in Rocket's case, the lack of politeness, okay? So hopefully you recognize this is Peggy Carter. So what she does in this Marvel universe is she creates shield, right? So she's very high in compassion. She cares about the problems of other people. She's interested in solving those problems and she wants to help out, okay? And because of that, she, seeing the problems and issues arising in the Captain America storyline, she creates an organization to help protect people in the world. She creates SHIELD. That's a, that, that is an act of high compassion. You really have to care for other people if you're setting up things to help them. The, the problem is sometimes you don't know, like, you know, the funny thing is the way the story plays out is that eventually S.H.I.E.L.D. gets corrupted and HYDRA infiltrates them. And so now you have this organization that was based off compassion that's hijacked to do an awful, terrible thing. Okay, and this is the problem with high compassion. Sometimes you are able to get manipulated or taken advantage of. Sometimes people with high compassion are convinced that they're doing something that's helpful, but in fact is actually harming the person that they're trying to help. Right? So for example, you know, it's very common, like a, a parent, a mother particularly, will want to make sure that their child doesn't have any harm done onto them. Like the last thing your I promise you, the last thing your mother wants to see is you get hurt, right? Badly or potentially die. And so, you know, the, your mother might tend to shelter you from the problems of the world. The issue with that is that it's actually making you weak, that compassion. It's not exposing you to challenges, to problems in the world. It's not making you competent, able to get through the problems you're gonna face in your life on your own, right? So 
For example, like, you know, if your mother, out of a loving and compassionate desire, does all your laundry and meals and cleaning for you, the reality is you're, <laughs> she's training you to be a bum because you're not taking care of those responsibilities yourself, right? You should be doing your own laundry at some point in your life because you want to live on your own. You want to be an independent, autonomous adult. You know, you should be learning how to clean up your own mess and potentially cook your own food take care of your own survival. Now, too much compassion won't allow the child to do that. It says, oh, no, no, I have to do solve this problem for the kid. But the thing is, then that child never learns how to solve that problem for themselves. And you know, one day, you, you know, sorry if I'm the first person to tell you this, but one day your parents, just like mine, will die. And you have to be ready for that day to be able to take care of yourself and potentially take care of the people around you, whether it's a family or friends, whatever it is. Right, so, so that's just a bit on compassion and some of the problems. Politeness, on the other hand, is your willingness to respect authority figures in some context. So people who are very polite, they will respect authority no matter what it is or where it is or what circumstance, right? So authority could be, you know, uh, school system, general, like uh, bureaucratic systems in general, so like the healthcare system and government system, but authority within the workplace as well. The boss, respecting the boss, listening to them, to uh, friendship hierarchies. Hey, this person's at the top. They're the kind of uh, most competent person, so we should respect what they're saying and doing. Okay, People who are in low politeness are less likely to give that respect. They're more likely to be the people who think, well, you need to earn my respect. Now, that's not a problem if you're also high in conscientiousness, if you're highly aware of the problems and you're also busy solving those problems. That's, that's not an issue if you're saying, okay, I'm busy doing my work, I'm solving problems, you need to earn my respect. But if you're low in conscientiousness and low in politeness, you're really not doing anything productive and you're going around you know, spouting off, hey, everybody's gotta earn my respect. Well, maybe there's nothing there to respect, right? That's, that could be a problem. I'm sure, I'm sure you know some people like that though, who want respect, but there's nothing there to respect. You know, they're not busy producing anything of value, okay? So Rocket is an interesting guy. He's very low politeness. You know, he'll tell you exactly what he thinks. He'll uh, be rude to you if he needs to. He'll disrespect you if you have to. He'll speak his mind freely. He doesn't care who you are. But once you have earned his respect, then he'll listen to you. He'll kind of do what he says. But you know, he, he's, a, he's a very smart, industrious guy. He's very conscientious, aware of what he's supposed to do. So, you know, it makes it challenging for him in that regard. But that's a, that's a bit on politeness. Okay, the last trait we have here is neuroticism. So if extroversion was the positive emotion, neuroticism is the negative emotion. They're on opposites. Okay, so people who are, so, so neuroticism is, is a measure of general sensitivity to negative emotions, such as pain, sadness, irritable or defensive anger, fear and anxiety. And so as a teacher, you know, getting to know my students, sometimes I wonder the students who have anxiety problems, they're always worried about the future. It makes me think, what is their neuroticism level? So for the record, my neuroticism is, is, is zero. It's, it's like, I, I really don't experience negative emotion. But the thing is, not everyone is like that. Some people could be 100th percentile neuroticism. And so the thing about that is that they'll see problems everywhere, and very likely they'll see problems where there aren't any that exist, right? So some students I have are constantly worried about the future, about every single test, every single assignment, every single little bit of grade, everything they treat it all the same as if it's a tiger hunting them down ready to kill them but that's the problem with being high in neuroticism is that you see major problems with everything it's all the same but the reality of life is that there are there's a tiered system of problems there are some problems that will kill you you know if you i don't know you have like a pain in your your, your chest and you're like oh man i can't feel the left side of my body yeah, yeah, maybe you should be concerned. Maybe having a stroke or a heart attack, right? That's a reasonable thing to be concerned about. But some people will cut their finger like a little paper cut and they'll get all neurotic. They'll say, oh my God, what if I, what if I, what if I lose my finger? What if I get an infection and die? It's like, hey, relax, it's just a paper cut, right? You know, whereas people like myself, it's like, <laughs> I, I'm sure I have several health issues occurring right now that I just don't care about because like, yeah, I'll figure them out eventually, right? But I'm low in neurotic, I'm, I'm zero in neuroticism, very low. I don't experience that negative emotion. I don't think the worst of the future. Now, it's not exactly healthy to be on either extreme, but the low neuroticism works for me because I have, again, high conscientiousness, high industriousness as well, right? So, 
and, and intelligence plays a role as well, but that's not really a personality trait. Knock it off, girls. I don't know what you're doing. Okay. So neuroticism breaks down into two particular emotions. We have withdrawal and volatility. So withdrawal is essentially like if you've ever had your friend criticize you or a teacher or you get a bad grade, if you are high in withdrawal, you're going to feel bad about that for potentially the next year. Right? I have a student in my grade 11 class who's still upset at me from first, second semester last year about their essay mark. <laughs> the student still holds it against me. Okay, so that person is very high in withdrawal. They're still bothered by that criticism of their work. And my assessment is that if you're high in withdrawal, it's likely that you interpret that criticism not about your work, but rather about you as a person in general, right? Which is not true, right? You need to be able to differentiate that. Boys, I can't have you in here right now. Man, it's gonna get you shy. Be shy. Get out this way. And stay out. Oh my God, that that would have been. We would have had to cut this whole thing off. Hold on. Okay. So, uh, most of you might not recognize this character. This is Hank Pym. This is the guy behind the whole Ant Man suit. So Hank Pym, as he's working with Shield, with the with uh, Howard Stark, he has a problem. Right? And, and they're basically saying, well, we want to do this with your technology. And he says, well, I want to do that. And then they say, well, no, you can't keep it to yourself. We need this technology. So Hank Pym throws a, uh, a hissy fit, like a little two-year-old. And he says, nope, if you're not doing what I want to do with it, you're not getting it at all. And so he disappears for 20, 30 years. Nobody knows where he goes. They thought he died. He is very, very high in withdrawal and neuroticism probably, right? He's always, he's always a little anxious, a little, always a little concerned, a little worried, right? And so the issue with withdrawal, high withdrawal, is that, you know, with life, you have to solve problems and you have to solve them sooner rather than later because, you know, we're all, we're all here uh, for a very limited amount of time. And if you're not solving your problems sooner rather than later, those problems continue to carry on. And then one day, you know, like uh, Noah's flood, psychologically speaking, maybe I'll do a whole interpretation analysis on that video as well. But one day, you know, everything will come crashing down in your life because you're not solving those problems, right? So people would prefer to ignore their problems because solving problems is hard, right? And then the issue is that when someone criticizes you and says that, hey, you have this issue, if you're anywhere higher up in withdrawal, you have a tendency to go, nope, I'm not gonna hear any of that, no thank you, you're wrong, I don't wanna feel bad about myself, right? So having high withdrawal can be detrimental to your progress as a person, as a human being. Right. On the other side, you have volatility. So hopefully you all know the Winter Soldier. I, I don't know why I, have, I found like the blurriest photo of this guy, but <laughs> the Winter Soldier, like what, you know, when he's Bucky, he's normal. He's fine. He's a regular guy. But the thing is, as soon as they start doing their calling, longing, whatever Russian sequence to turn him into a kill machine, he becomes a kill machine. He's very volatile, right? So volatility is your emotional reactivity. You know, if somebody says something to you that you don't like or does something you don't like, some people respond by slapping them. Usually small people, because they feel like they can get away with it. <laughs> right? Some people respond by going, eh, whatever, all good. And some people respond somewhere in between, depending on who it is or what the words are, the circumstance, they'll have a response. But that's what volatility is. It's your emotional response. How emotional are you, right? And so if every time someone criticizes you, you immediately snap back and you have to attack them back, you're probably high in volatility. Now the problem with that can be if you're always snapping back on your friends, you know, if they're trying to help you, let's say, criticize you. The issue with that is that, you know, eventually they're just gonna stop telling you the truth because every time they tell you the truth, you spaz out about it. Right, so if you're high in volatility, um, you know, again, this thing, the, these negative emotions can get in your own way, get in your own progress. Right? And so if you experience these emotions, and if you think just based off these explanations, that, hey, this quadra, I might be high up in that category, you know, those are things that you can work on. It's cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay? And uh, that wraps up the explanation for the, um, the big five, but just tying some of this stuff together. So the more you know about your own temperament, your own personality, the way you interact with the world, the better you're able to make changes to your life, right? So again, if you're someone who's high in neuroticism, recognizing that you're high in neuroticism will essentially allow you to go, hey, maybe that voice in my head is wrong. You know, that voice in my head that tells me, hey, you're going to fail this assignment, you're going to fail this test, 
this essay. Maybe it's wrong if you're high in neuroticism. Maybe you have an inclination to think that the worst is going to happen, even though you've sufficiently prepared. Now, if you're low in neuroticism, you might not even have that voice. So developing a system to remind yourself to get your job, whatever it is done. So if you have an essay, you have an assignment, you know, you have to get to work, putting that into a schedule, putting reminders in your physical environment or your digital environment, Put a re putting a reminder on your phone that, hey, work on your essay, get it done the due days next week, work on the project or study for that test. You have a final on certain day, right? Or you have work on Monday at 6 p.m. Make sure you get there on time. Leave at 5.30, 5 o'clock, however long it takes you to get to work. You know, um, and coming back to conscientiousness, uh, I'll actually just put the explanation on the board since, I mean, I know this stuff quite well, but I wouldn't assume that you learned it very well in one presentation. So conscientiousness is one of the, one of the best determined, one of the best things used to determine how successful you'll be in, in some sort of job, right? Any productive job, particularly, um, you want, if you have a leader, so a business owner, a principal, someone running a classroom, if you're in a leadership position, ideally you want people who are high in conscientiousness, again, because they're going to follow through on their obligation, they're gonna have attention to detail and hard work, they're gonna be persistent. They're gonna make sure they work through and solve that problem, right? So people low in conscientiousness might struggle to actually keep their goals in check, right? I, I just out of curiosity, feel free to just raise your hand or not. How many of you set a goal for 2023, right? So a couple of us. Now, part of it is how many places do you have reminders for those goals? For me, I have two spots in my, in my bedroom. I have one when I sit down on my computer chair, right above my computer screen, I have one written there, a piece of paper, and I have another one right by my bed. So I always see this reminder. Uh, for the record, my goal for this year was to upload 15 YouTube videos. This will be my second, <laughs> right? But where you are in your life and whatever goals you have, conscientious people will set up reminders and they'll constantly, persistently work hard at that. I was just talking to Mr. Murphy as well. So on the orderliness side, orderliness also has a relationship with how clean you keep things. And so in terms of relationships, so women tend to be more orderly than men, right? And if you, if so you're nodding your head, your room's probably messy, right? No? Okay. But... <laughs> Okay, maybe for other reasons but uh, generally speaking you know most women when they engage in a relationship with a man you know then maybe they go over to his house and they see they, they're typically disgusted by what they see because this guy's house is filthy and they and disgust is the correct emotion so hey dude get your life together right your house looks like this what does your life look like like get it together right so that disgust sensitivity, the high orderliness is actually very useful. Having that criticism is very useful for actually making positive change in your life, right? Sometimes you need the girl you like to tell you to get your life together for you to actually go and get your life together, right? It's very necessary. Um, and sometimes it's preferable if it's someone you like and someone you're romantically interested in rather than your mother nagging you because maybe you're more inclined to do it for the girl you like rather than your mother, right? For a variety of reasons. Okay. Let's see, what other ones do I want to quickly talk about? Um, um, extroversion. Uh, we could talk a little bit more about agreeableness, but I think we did that. So again, I'll just wrap it up by saying, um, if you can, you know, I, I can give you the resource. Uh, you can buy this personality test. You can take it yourself, answer the questionnaire. You can figure out where your traits are. It's, about, it's gonna be about 12 bucks, I think, Canadian. Um, it's very much worth every dollar you spend. It'll give you a lengthy description of your personality traits and what that means and how that might look for you. But one of the things that we really miss teaching in school is helping students to understand themselves better, to understand what their temperament is and where they would prefer to be in life. So for myself as an extroverted person, it's very necessary that I'm in an environment that is very people oriented and because of my conscientiousness as well as my extroversion it's very necessary that there's several problems for me to deal with as, as simultaneously you know if there aren't i just get bored if i'm in a cubicle office job by myself it makes me want to kill myself right because I, I i just i do not want to be 
just by myself all day. It's incredibly boring in front of a computer, you know, unless you're just like, I don't know, watching YouTube videos, doing whatever you want, hanging out at home. That's different, right? But if I have to spend eight hours a day, I prefer to spend those eight hours around people. But understanding this can help you decide with what you want to do after you graduate, right? If you're very high in extroversion, but you're also, you have really good science marks and math marks, people are going to tell you, they're going to say, oh, go be an engineer. But engineers are not people people. They're thing people. They want to solve problems about things, not solve problems and deal with people, right? And so that makes it very difficult. Um, I kind of wanted to make a note on compassion. So the thing about uh, agreeableness as well is it, it is also a people-oriented uh, personality trait. Uh, for myself, funny enough, I'm, I'm low on agreeableness and my politeness is like very, very low. Right, so if you ever wonder why I say offhand rude comments, that's why. Uh, the reason why I say them is because my compassion is very high. So I tend not to try to criticize students as a person, but rather what they're doing. And you know, you can feel a type of way about that. You're more than welcome to. But the thing is that you know to suggest someone to fix their behavior is an attempt at get me wanting them to be a better person, a better version of themselves, right? And so that's how that compassion bit plays in. But the thing is, if you have low compassion, low politeness and low agreeableness, you just say rude things just to say them. And sometimes the rude thing you say is about the person to make fun of them and to make them feel bad and not to actually be constructive. Like, hey, I care about you, so I'm telling you to get your life together. I'm telling you to get your act together, right? And so it's important to understand these traits so that we can see them in the people around us in our environment. And then we can, you know, figure out from there what we want to do with that. So I think I'll finish on that because it looks like we're pulling up on 37 minutes here. And uh, I don't know, I guess some of you are getting ready to nod off. I hope you're enjoying that. But that wraps that up for the Big Five personality. Thank you.